are among the shorter words in the English language. And they stand for two fundamental concepts. Up and out are expressions of our curiosity. If we give a small child a set of blocks, we hardly have to tell the child what to do with them. Few children try and see how long or how wide a structure they can make by laying the blocks on the floor. No, they try and put as many blocks as they can, one on top of the other. Of course, up isn't very high at first. As the blocks tumble to the ground, children learn that how carefully the blocks are lined up, coupled with the force of gravity, has a lot to do with how high a block tower can be. So without realising it, they learn about stability. It becomes part of their common sense. Now, as soon as children can move about on all fours, they begin to explore the boundaries of the world they live in. Much to the consternation of parents and babysitters, they address the second fundamental question. How far is out? Well, it's been a long while since I was a child, but those two questions are still worth tackling. How high is up? And how far is out? And I'd like to look at those questions from where we are today and project where we might be in the future, both here on Earth and outside of it. We've come a long way from a set of building blocks when it comes to up. Structures such as the CN Tower soar some 700 metres, 2,000 feet into the sky. And buildings like the World Trade Center in New York, more than a hundred stories. And it's structures like these that demonstrate the magnitude of our victory over gravity. And can we go even higher? Does gravity itself impose limits that our technology can't overcome? And perhaps more important, how high should we go? Is there a limit that human dignity and civilization impose on us? Some people might say we've gone too high already. But let's start with the technical questions. What are the physical limits to the height of our buildings? And how might we overcome those limits in the future? Now, the tall buildings that populate downtown areas share some characteristics, but differ in many others. Some are office towers, others are apartment blocks, some serve multiple purposes. They often use different construction methods, but one thing is true, they all go up. So let's call them vertical structures, simply to distinguish them from other buildings. In a way, these vertical structures are combinations of all the systems we've already seen in smaller buildings. But you can't just make a tall building by stacking a bunch of smaller buildings one on top of the other. They'd all fall over like a pile of blocks. No, in order to stand tall, the high-rise vertical structure has to solve two essential problems. First, it has to have a way to get the weight of each floor down to the ground. And secondly, it should be able to brace itself against the wind to keep from blowing over. So let's first look at the way the loads are collected on each floor. We are talking primarily about the dead weight of the structure. High-rise buildings, just like simple stone walls, get heavier as they get higher. The dead load at the bottom floors of the structure is much higher than the dead load at the top. That too is like the stone wall, where the bottom stones have to cope with the weight of all the stones on top of them. In such a stone wall, the load is transferred to the ground by compression. It is evenly distributed throughout the entire wall. But the inside of a high-rise tower is not like a continuous lump of material. Somehow, the weight of the building has to be carried down to the ground in some other way. And in a high-rise, the walls as such don't carry the load. The walls of a high-rise building work mostly to keep the heat in and the wind out. Often, they are merely curtain walls hung on the structure of the building. So how do we get the weight down to the ground the building is sitting on? Uh, perhaps I should say, sitting in. Buildings like trees have to have roots. Well, this is accomplished by a series of columns and beams, and it is this load-carrying mechanism that determines some of the building's appearance. 
Now, in a tall building, it's always better to keep all the vertical members in a straight line above each other, like our set of building blocks. Each of the columns takes a part of the weight of the building. The more columns you have, the smaller each one can be. Of course, there is a price to pay using a lot of columns. Each floor becomes broken up into smaller spaces. That's not a problem if you want to make a lot of small apartments or offices, but could present difficulties if you wanted to have, say, a large open display area, a lobby, or whatever. So how we arrange the columns is not only based on making the building work as a structure, but also work as efficient space for the people who use it. There are three basic ways to arrange the columns and get the dead load down to the ground. There's what we call bay collection, where the collecting columns are evenly distributed over the whole floor plan. Then you've got free span collection. The columns are arranged only around the edges of the building. This gives you completely open space inside the building, but may make for small glass areas on the outside. Then the third method is called cantilever collection, where the load collecting zone is right smack in the middle, the opposite of the free span. Each of the floors is a cantilever out from the central pillars. These arrangements could also be combined with suspension systems to transfer the loads to the ground. This would also avoid a build-up of the size of the columns at the bottom. Here, we have a central column with suspended floors. The West Coast Transmission Building uses a version of this system. Or giant trusses that have ten floors sitting on top and ten more floors hanging below. And the combinations can be infinite. And none of them will be the best solution. They're all the best solution if they are appropriate to the type of building we want and many of them may well use the principle of pre-stressing in their structure. And to get a sense of how pre-stressing works, I can make a high-rise tower out of these children's building blocks. Now even I can make it quite high, but if I blow on it, it will fall over. However, if I put a string up the middle to act like pre-stressed reinforcing, it won't. Now there are two approaches to building the really high skyscrapers of today and tomorrow. The first is called the tube, and it means what it says. The idea is to put what amounts to a skin of vertical columns around the outside of the structure. It can create a tall, strong building. The columns don't just carry the loads, but they give the building bracing too. The tallest office buildings to date, the World Trade Center in New York, is a tubular skyscraper. Nature has invented its own version of the tube skyscraper. It's called a termite hill, and the way the termite builds it gives us the clue as to why we can have a hollow structure and still have a strong one. They really are the skyscrapers of the insect world. These insects have managed to make structures millions of times their own height that don't easily fall down. But the termite nests have something else that is remarkable. They have a hole running right up the middle that gives the nest an air conditioning vent. It gets rid of the heat that builds up inside the tunnels from all that frenzied termite activity. But that presents a bit of a puzzle. How do the termites know where the middle of the nest is, so that they can put the hole right there? Well, the termites have managed to find what we call the neutral axis of their own nest. But what is the neutral axis? Well, this pencil eraser holds the answer. You may remember we used it when we talked about beans. Now, when I held the pencil eraser horizontally like this and pushed down on it, the top went into compression, but the bottom was stretched, or in tension. That meant that somewhere between the top and the bottom, there's no compression or tension at all. Now, consequently, in the beam, that means we can have less material in the middle, because if there's no compression or tension there, there's no stress there either. This point is what we call 
the neutral axis in a beam. Now, if I were to tip the eraser on its end and let the wind blow on it, then the same thing happens. This surface is in tension, but that one is in compression. But the wind can blow from any direction, and so any surface can be in tension or compression. But always there is a neutral axis where there is no stress, right down the middle. The same thing is true for the termite nest. Wind puts loads on the outside, but in the middle there is a neutral axis where the stress is minimal. It means that for the termite, the bits of mud at the neutral axis are the ones that come out the easiest. Voila! The termite has, without knowing it, stumbled on the virtue of tubular construction. Here's what I mean. A building based on the tube principle can have amazing strength. Let me demonstrate. Here's a piece of ordinary writing paper. Seems pretty flimsy. Certainly wouldn't hold up anything by itself. But if I roll it up into a tube and secure it with a piece of sticky tape, it will hold up this book. And another one. So, not only is a building built on the tube principle strong, but it also acts as if it was a single hollow column, providing a central core where the people will go. But there's another way of solving the loading problem, and that's using a building called the megastructure. The idea of a megastructure, also called a superframe, is deceptively simple. A very, very tall building is divided into several smaller buildings on top of each other. But what happens is that every so often, say every 10 or 15 floors, huge columns placed around the edge of the structure receive a portion of the load via large beams or trusses. And the elevators or stairwells can even run inside these giant columns. So as taller and taller buildings are now being built, we have to find clever ways to keep them from swaying too much in the wind. It's ironic, but one of the solutions to overcoming the problem of tall buildings being too heavy for their own support columns was to find lighter construction materials, which in turn has created another problem. Such tall buildings are less stiff than they would otherwise have been. That means it's easier for them to sway in the wind. And one of the ways to combat the wind is to play with the building's shape. In fact, and this may sound surprising, for a very high building, the way you brace it against the wind is often the major factor that determines the building's form. It also becomes a determining factor in the price tag on the building. Now, all tall buildings oscillate, that is, they sway back and forth in the wind a little bit. In that sense, they are like blades of tall grass. The degree of swaying can be enough to spill full cups of coffee, and sometimes the people working on the highest floors may feel something akin to seasickness. The World Trade Center in New York sways as much as 11 inches in the wind perfectly safely. Now, the higher a building is, the more the sway could be. The traditional way of counteracting sway has been to put as many of the supporting elements as possible at the edge of the structure. A more recent idea is to take advantage of a central structural core, which minimizes the sway through the use of pre-stressing. But even this becomes inadequate when the building is very high. There is yet another way to dampen the effect of the wind, and this does work for very tall buildings. You can put a giant movable counterweight on the top. Here's how it works. You know how you could pump a swing to make it go higher and higher? Well, what you're doing is that you're shifting your weight on the swing in synchronization to the movement of the swing itself. And if you want to stop the swing because it's going too high, you do the opposite. You try and throw your weight in a direction opposite to the way the swing is moving. Well, that's what the moving counterweights at the top of a tall building can do. They're called tuned mass dampers, and they can actually keep the amount of swaying down to comfortable proportions. This system has another great advantage. Not only can it soften the blow of the wind, 
but the same counterweight system can also give a building protection during earthquakes. In fact, with these new structural systems, some architects and engineers believe that we can make buildings as much as 150 or 200 storeys high. That's almost twice as high as the highest buildings we have now. And it leads us to the second set of questions we started out with when we began to address the concept of up. Even if we can go much higher, should we? Does human dignity and being civilised impose limits on us? Here's a quick quiz for a dull, blustery day. Can you tell right away what city this is from its skyline? The fact is there's a remarkable similarity from skyline to skyline, which is why the Hollywood filmmakers can get away with using the high towers of Toronto whilst telling people that they're really in Los Angeles or Dallas or anywhere. There's a certain sameness to the skylines of the great cities anywhere in the world. Early in this century, San Francisco looked like this. Today, you'd be hard-pressed to tell the skyline of San Francisco from the skyline of Vancouver. Even the great cities of Europe have fallen to high-rise mania. When we look around at cities today and realise that we could be almost anywhere on Earth, it says a lot about what we've done to the inner cores of our cities. All these skyscrapers bunched together have produced several undesirable effects. Multiple office and apartment towers make our downtown streets windy. On an average day, this can be an annoyance, but in bad weather, pedestrian levels can become hostile territory. Walking is difficult, Doors cannot be opened and higher up, windows could break, showering debris downwards. Increasingly then, wind tunnels are used to test new building designs for dangerous wind patterns. The models are fixed to rotating bases in order to simulate various wind conditions and directions. Changes are then recommended to the designers. For instance, in this location it was learnt that strong gusts hitting the tops of nearby towers could deflect downwards to street level. This is called the downwash effect. So they added protective canopies over the sidewalk, which deflects the downwash away from the pedestrians. Another problem is that very little daylight gets down to street level anymore. We are paying a price for the economic pressures to squeeze more people onto each square metre of ground space. Today, the more floor space you can get from a piece of land, the more economically viable it is. So it is logical that the people who own the land want to build higher and higher and higher. What we have to worry about is the hidden cost to society of going up. We have to look at the adverse physical and mental effects these buildings have on the people who work and live in them, day in and day out. We also have to look at the destruction of our sense of community, our contact with our neighbours. Some new ideas are emerging, which will give us the opportunity to design vertical structures quite differently. These concepts encompass and make accessible what I call urban high space in breadth. What I'm talking about is the kind of scheme where at least the first couple of stories may spread out sideways, away from the main vertical structure. So we might have our roads and rails go under the structure and put the people space up a story or two. It's like bringing the ground up a bit. This idea has a great future in cities where downtown areas are already covered with, for instance, rail marshalling yards that are still being used. We've already seen another marvellous example of how high can be combined with wide. It's the Habitat Complex that was built in Montreal for Expo 67. You can get an idea of how it worked by looking at a small apartment building just a few storeys high and imagining that instead of it being a building, it was this bank of kitchen drawers here, where each drawer 
represents a separate floor. Now, supposing I pulled the bottom drawer out all the way, and then the one above, not quite so far, and so on, all the way up. Now, had that been an apartment building, each one would have had its own garden or patio, which, of course, is the roof of the apartment below. Inside, the space where the drawer had been is now empty and could be used for streets or walkways at each level. And then you could, of course, combine this with other buildings and get an even more varied urban skyline. That's the essence of habitat. Sadly, what was built was only a fraction of what was originally intended, and the economic and social benefits of the whole concept were never fully realised. In fact, this idea has still not really been exploited to any extent, anywhere yet. But when it is, it might give us a much more humane environment to live in. And in thinking about the future, there's one more stop on our journey through structures. Now that we can escape Earth's gravity, it is interesting to explore some of the ideas that we can use to make structures out in space. Because we have to change our way of thinking when we build in space. Everything we've done on the Earth was fighting gravity with push and pull. But in space there is no up or down. There is only out. This means that we can build ultralight space frames. There is no dead weight to deal with, so the members can be very slender, yet very strong. We could also use pneumatics, of course, but that idea is not quite so simple. Inflatables will have some future in space, but you sure wouldn't want to get a puncture while you were on the inside. So even a pneumatic structure in space may need some kind of skeleton to keep it from total collapse. there is an intriguing system that people have been exploring and that is the notion of tensegrity. Now that's not a word you'll find in most dictionaries. It comes from tensional integrity and what that means is that we can now build structures that depend completely on continuous tension. Now since in outer space there's no gravity or up and down, our structures may develop stresses in all directions. And that won't matter if we have a structural system that could be stretched in all directions in tension without relying on supports outside of the system itself. If that sounds like a tent without pegs, well, it is. Only this time, if we were to pitch such a tent in space, it won't fall down. There is no down to fall to. Look at this model. This is a totally self-sufficient system. It comprises of rods held apart by rope. The rods don't touch each other, and the rope is continuous. That's a bit strange, I grant, but it's the essence of tensegrity. If we were to put a covering on it, we would actually have an ideal enclosure for use in outer space, because it doesn't matter which way up it is. Here's another using even more members. But there is a snag with a system of this sort. All the members must remain intact, otherwise the entire structure could collapse. You see, we've looked at some structural systems before, like space frames, where we could miss out the odd member or two and it wouldn't matter because the forces would be redirected along other ones. Not so with tensegrity. There's no redundancy with this system. Oh, it's very efficient, but there's no margin for error. Some experimental tensegrity structures have already been built, such as this beam. It was built by professors Jim Stratt and Gulza Haider at Carlton University in Ottawa. It's unbelievably light, while being equally unbelievably strong. Structures based on tensegrity might in the next century be as common in space as the high-rise tower is on the Earth today. With a suitable cover, you've got a completely controlled environment. Which is what we've been trying to do with all the structures we've looked at in this series. And although they may look complex at first sight, they are all based on compression and tension.
That's quite a mind-expanding idea to contemplate from the comfort of one's own backyard. It seemed so far removed from the real world. But of course, structure surrounds us all the time. So I'll just get rid of my geodesic dome over by the membrane structure there. Lean back in my post and beam chair against the vertical cantilever underneath my favorite horizontal and vertical cantilever system. I better check under the dome to see if the barbecue's that. Oh, it's like Chinese again tonight. So I'll just put up my space structure underneath my membrane, reach out, and give a squeeze of my arch into my shell structure and give a pull. Mm. Because it's all just a matter of push and pull. <clears throat> Of course, there's the post and beam fence itself that closes in the garden and gives you privacy. Then there's the paving slab, the cross brace table that's triangulated too, gives stability. This is all the natural things, the leaves themselves, the suspension of plants. And it just goes on. There's, of course, even my clothes are structures to some extent. I have to say nothing of my own body. A bit of an old structure, but there we are. 